Okay, so guys, what I'd like to do is I'd like to explain to you what the rest of the quarter is going to look like. Um, so in my screen cat or in my, my group me message, um, we are going to double up. We are going to use third period as a second period class. Um, but guys, I'm, I, I, I've got to be honest with you. I'm a little nervous about how this is going to go. Um, so we are transitioning into chapter 19 right now, um, which is all about um, entropy uh, and Gibbs free energy and spontaneity. Um, you all should have done the chapter 19 summary, so you should be at least loosely conversant in these ideas. Um, but here's the problem. Um, when, we, when we get into chapter 19, obviously I've never taught this back-to-back. -back. And typically the way that this works is today, the first day of chapter 19, uh, we talk about entropy. And it creates kind of a crisis um, because entropy, guys, is, is a very, very real thing, but it's also a very abstract thing. And so typically the way that this goes is we talk about entropy and your mind is like medium blown and then you get home and you do the homework and then your mind is like more blown and then we come back and we answer questions and then based upon some of those questions we then progress into Gibbs free energy which sort of resolves some of the concerns and, and things go well. Um, today, we're not going to have the advantage of you going home, getting confused, maybe, and then coming back and going, oh, let's, let's resolve some of the confusion. So guys, I'm gonna, do, <laughs> I'm gonna do what I can to create some confusion today. Um, but no, we're, we're, going to, we're gonna get into this as we can. But understand that we are going to then push through and basically cover chapter 19 today. Um, the reason that we're doing that is, is this. Um, when we then get together again on Friday, we're done with this unit. And we will be uh, sitting the, the unit test. Um, and so, guys, I know that that's a little, a little intimidating that you're going from today learning all of chapter 19 and then being held accountable for that material um, on Friday. Um, but I don't know how else to do that um, simply because we do have third period and we can't do labs in that space and we don't want to, as we said, waste that time. So what I'm envisioning is this test will bleed into then third period, um, and then we'll come back after the um, after the the break again, and we'll work on rewriting both of the tests, um, which will then move us into fall break. Because um, I can't I when I sat down and pulled this together, whoa, what happened to my header here? Um, I really couldn't figure out another way to space this material. I can't see a way that we can avoid doubling up today and doing the test on Friday and still getting everything done before the end of the quarter. Yeah. Well, so the end of the quarter is the 14th. Um, we don't yet know what's going to happen here. Um, the. There's some talk that we're just going to make this an L to Z day, those L to Z days, um, just to maintain the fidelity of what we're doing. Um, some of that's out of our hands. Some of it will be based on what county health has to say. So we don't really know. So, um, guys, I guess the best that I can offer is we're going to dig in and try this and uh, see how it goes. Um, understand that I feel a great responsibility to protect and work with you guys. Um, so understand that we will, we will handle this appropriately. Um, we'll dig into this. We'll start in a minute. We'll start into entropy. 
this could go great. I mean, I, as, as you're probably picking up, I'm nervous about this simply because I've never tried it before, but maybe this will prove to be better and maybe it'll work out that the material does flow and that we can answer the questions as we get into Gibbs free energy and things just work out great. But if that's not the case, just trust that when we take the test on Friday, I won't let it kill you. Yeah. Yeah, so what will have to happen is, so yeah, so L through Z will take the test next Tuesday. Yeah, what are you thinking, Sophia? I'm just Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I, I mean, teachers right now are going, holy smokes, how do we manage this? Um, you guys have sort of the advantage of just being able to focus on your little part of this disaster. Um, we get to manage the whole thing. Um, so guys, any, can you bring any clarity to this other than let's just try it and see what happens? All right. That was mildly motivating. All right. So guys, with that said, we actually do need to address homework first. Um, so this goes away. These can go away for now. Let me sort of get my proverbial ducks in a row. All right, so we need to go back and look at calorimetry stuff. Then in addition to that, we're going to talk entropy. And then we're also going to talk Gibbs free energy. Guys, you are going, whether you have homework questions or not, you are going to need your um, books open to chapter 19, well, 5 now for homework, but you're going to need your books open to chapter 19 in a moment. Um, you're also going to need your AP equation sheets at the ready. And um, let me do this really quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that. And. This. And put that away and grab homework solutions. And I know, guys, that we've already looked at some of this. But I'll just put it all up there for you. Okay, so let me get, does anybody else need a copy of the equation sheet? There you go. And let me grab my book. Okay, so guys, if you remember, we did look, oh, sorry, Nathan. My eyes are not used to scanning across such a broad array of people. Okay, so guys, we did look a little bit at some of these questions, but we did not get into um, the tail end of these uh, relative to, uh, well, what questions do you have? Are we really okay? So uh, heat capacity, remember, sort of sounded, we looked at 51 which kind of sounded like word games. Again, guys, we talked about the idea that this gets more clear once we start into lab, which will not be till after fall break. Um, and then we started doing Hess's Law by manipulation. And then we did um, some Hess's Law stuff um, by, uh, by equation here. Um, and again, guys, it is important that we remember the ends are gone but we're writing down the equation. Then we are structuring the equation uh, with the particular reactants and products that are given in any particular example. Then we're plugging in values and then we're solving. So guys, on the AP test, this is what these have got to look like. You need the equation. You need it rewritten for the particular components of the reaction that you're studying. Then you need numbers with units and then you need an answer, yeah. Oh, no, put, yeah, you can put the N in there for sure, absolutely. Uh, what I'm saying is, is you've got to have each of the four lines, if you will. This is the minimum requirement. 
So guys, are you really okay? You're good? Okay. So what I'd like to do then, um, and I have to do this in such a way that your grades don't end up on the screencast. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to jump over here. Um, so this is Hessen Calimetry. Uh, so we'll record this. And we will record this. Okay, so let's do this first. Braden, were you good on this assignment? Yeah. Matt, how about you? Yeah. Donnie? Yeah. Sophia? Yeah. Um, Annika's, I guess I'll just put zeros. Ethan, were you good? Yeah. Um, Diana? Yeah. Chandler? Yeah. Oh gosh, sorry, Chandler, wait, I think I just gave you both zeros. Um, okay. So 10 and 10, Isaac is gone. Ellie, yeah. Landon, Nathan, yeah. um, Emma's not here, Max is not here, Leslie is not here, um, Gage is not here, Ronnie's not here, Kaylee's not here, Daniel's gone, that's it. Did I get everybody? Is that really it? Okay, then guys, what I wanna do is this. Um, and this is an honor call, but obviously I trust you all. Um, what I want to do is I want to not collect from you your chapter 19 uh, four quadrant summaries. Um, I'd like to leave them with you um, so that you can use them to study off of. But I would like to give you credit for them. Um, so guys, remember the requirements. You needed one page per subsection of the chapter. And guys, I'm just going to call these scores just like, so is it done or is it not? Um, and again, one page per um, subsection. Braden, were you good? Yeah. Matt, how about you? No. no. Donnie, were you good? No. Sophia, how about you? No. Annika is gone. Ethan? No. Uh, Diana? Yes. Chandler? Isaac is gone. Ellie. Landon. Nathan. Emma's not here. Max, is that everybody then? So, no Leslie, no Gage, no Ronnie, no Kaylee. Oh, well, of course, they're at the bottom of the alphabet. How stupid am I? Wow. So what I can look forward to is the people in L through Z, will it be at the bottom? <laughs> I'm discovering new things every day. Oh, my good heavens. All right. Um, so, guys, the only ones that I recorded is, yes, were Braden, Donnie, Diana, Chandler, Nathan. Yes? Yeah, 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 I would say before Friday. You're okay. I mean, you're not okay, but you're okay. All right, so let's get, what's that? I didn't write it down, but I didn't do it. I realized it. I know we talked about it. Yeah, no, I know. Bring them Friday or email me when they're done. All right, so guys, here we go. Um, Tell you what I can do, guys, if you can get those chapter 19 summaries done, um, let's say before Wednesday, drop me an email and I'll just give you credit for them. Um, I know you guys have a lot going on. Okay, so guys, I'm going to take just a second um, and let's see if I can't create... Okay, so if we get to there, all right, I think we can use that 
Okay, I think, guys, I have a way that we can link these together and this will work. So let, let's do this. Guys, gather at the beginning of chapter 19 with me. I almost said something derogatory about you can't find the beginning of chapter 19, but then I realized this is coming from the guy that didn't figure out that the people that aren't here would be at the bottom of the alphabet. So at this point, you know what? There's no such thing as stupid questions. Um, everything balances out. I have completely resigned the right to be sarcastic because I'm struggling as much as you guys are. All right. Hey, so guys, for those of you that have had the opportunity to look over um, chapter 19. Um, guys, I, I, I have a question for you. And this question is not rhetorical. And this question does have an answer. This is not subjective. This is not what did you think of chapter 19. Guys, this is an important question to ask and answer. Um, some of you may be at a little bit of a disadvantage because you were not, uh, you haven't done this yet. But guys, for those of you that have, whether you did the, the outline or not, um, guys, what's the most important idea in chapter 19? Or, or okay, so well, then maybe that's what we do is we talk about the, the, the ideas and then we narrow that down into the most important idea. So first of all, we should talk... Who gets to decide what the most important idea is? The AP authors, right? They're the ones that write the test. We bow at their feet. So, guys, maybe the question would be better stated, what do the AP gods think that the most important thing in the chapter is? Because I would agree with you that entropy is a big idea. Other big ideas in chapter 19. And even if you haven't done it, maybe you could thumb through it and find important ideas. Free energy is big. We're going to call it Gibbs free energy, but you can use those interchangeably. That's the answer. Guys, the most important thing in chapter 19 is, is a reaction spontaneous under the given conditions? And so, guys, I would even encourage you to scratch the idea down that the most important thing in this chapter is spontaneous processes. Now guys, as we get into this, the first thing we need to do is define what spontaneous means. And then we're literally going to spend the rest of the day chasing this down. So let's define it, and then let's sort of begin to chip away at this and begin to get a sense of what makes reactions spontaneous. So, guys, before I give you the definition, for even for those of you that haven't read the chapter, um, when you think of something being spontaneous, what do you think of? Something random, something constant, something... Something sudden, I like that. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah, right. Hey, that person's really spontaneous. I want to be around them because they're they're doing stuff, right? Yeah, it's not fun to be around somebody that's not spontaneous because they just tend to want to sit there. It's more fun to be around somebody that suddenly does stuff because they're spontaneous, and you know if you're around them, stuff is going to be happening. Well, guys, that's actually what spontaneous means in reactions as well. It simply means a reaction that occurs on its own without any uh, outside intervention. So, guys, if you've got a, a, a friend that's spontaneous, you don't have to convince them, hey, let's go do something, because they're probably already doing something, and you just have to get in their wake and follow them around. Well, guys, spontaneous means the same things here. So this then, gang, lays out for us what we need to figure out in the next period of time. Obviously, we're going to take a break. But, guys, the big question is this. When, and when we say when, we mean under what conditions, 
Under what conditions is a process spontaneous? Now, guys, along the way, we need to talk about the, the, the things that lead to spontaneity, but also we need to talk about how we talk about spontaneity. So, guys, the way that we're going to approach this is we are going to tie spontaneity to energy. Then we're going to have a little crisis where we find an example of something that should not be spontaneous. Again, it simply means happens on its own. And guys, by fixing that crisis, we're going to learn some new terms. We're going to bring entropy into the conversation. And then in the second half of this, as Donnie mentioned, we're then going to bring in free energy, Gibbs free energy, which then becomes the definitive tiebreaker that says this is when a reaction is spontaneous. And guys, that's how we're going to end the day. So let me just take you there right now so that you're ready to have this conversation. So guys, grab your books and open them to page 809. And leave them on page 809. You see that table at the bottom, table 19.3? Guys, that is going to be where we're going to end the entire day today. We said that the most important thing in chapter 19, the most important thing in this unit is spontaneity. Well, guys, that's where we're going to bring this all together in table 809, and that will be where we'll wrap up the day. You okay? Okay, so guys, bring it back then to this idea of spontaneity, and let's, let's play with this a little bit. So guys, the first question that we need to ask and answer is this. What are the characteristics of reactions that are spontaneous? So guys, let's talk about it. What are things that you know to be spontaneous? Trying to keep the conversation in the realm of chemistry, physics, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So guys, if you take a piece of iron and set it outside, or even not, do you have to do anything to force that piece of metal to rust, or does it just happen? Well, it just happens. So guys, iron rusting is an example of a spontaneous process. Other examples of things that happen all on their own. Yeah. Say it again. A bomb? A bomb? Yeah. Okay. So, and it's actually, so, it, <laughs> so if we've got a bomb, we understand that hopefully it's not going to blow up until we get it started, right? Which brings up an interesting point. And guys, you've got to understand this. When we talk about spontaneous, we understand that spontaneous means happens all on its own. But you understand with the bomb, we have to pull the trigger, right? So the idea is that triggering event does not discount this from spontaneity. So a bomb doesn't go off all on its own, we hope, right? But once we add that initial bit of energy, pull the trigger or whatever, that starts it, it's at that point that we identify it as being spontaneous. So bomb. Another example of that would be a Bunsen burner, right? You understand that if we hook up a Bunsen burner, it's not going to burn until we spark it. But a Bunsen, light, a Bunsen burner burning is spontaneous because once it starts, it happens on its own. Is that okay? Guys, other examples of spontaneous processes. Let's think about that. So evaporation. This is tricky because if you've got a substance that evaporates, it has to take in heat for that to happen. Water, does, water in a very cold room does not evaporate. So water evaporated, Nathan, that's a really interesting point. And teasing this apart will be very instructive. So if, if we've got water, look, a beaker. If we've got water in a beaker, this water will not evaporate unless it absorbs energy from the room. If we put this outside on a cold day, it will actually not evaporate because that evaporation process requires the input of energy from the room. What you're about to find out is the difference between things that are and are not spontaneous. Yeah. 
That's interesting. So in order to freeze, the substance needs to be able to dump energy into the room, right? So can it, and so it, it doesn't require something from the room, it requires something going into the room. So yes, that would be spontaneous. Now what about melting ice? That would not be spontaneous because the room has to give energy to the stuff. Yes. Beautiful. And that's exactly the idea. So let me, so, and guys, sometimes people think about things like this. Um, so if you want to see a more, a more physical example, so guys, what about this? If you take a block and let go of it, do you have to do anything to get it to fall? That's spontaneous. Now guys, what if we want the, the block to rise? Right. And that's not spontaneous because in order for that block to rise, the block cannot raise itself. The system, as you were saying, has to add energy to make it happen. So if energy has to go in for it to take place, that would not be spontaneous because it doesn't happen on its own. But blocks falling or balls rolling downhill, those happen spontaneously because they're releasing energy rather than taking it in. Yeah. Okay, and so it, it, so for some, we're not going to talk a lot about work. We will in a minute, but for right now, our conversation is going to be about energy exchanged in the form of heat. We're about to look at something called the egg drop puzzle, and when we do, we will bring in work really quickly, but for now, we're going to think about it in terms of heat, but we understand they both are ways to exchange energy. So, go ahead. Okay, so let's talk about that because that's actually equilibrium. We'll talk in a second though. So guys, let me lay out for you some examples. Let me lay out some examples of things that are spontaneous. So guys, this is what we're saying. Spontaneous processes lose energy to the room. And I love that Nathan brought up that idea of evaporation because that is not spontaneous. In order for water to evaporate, it has to absorb energy from the room. But Chandler, you then said freezing, and freezing would be spontaneous because that's a loss of energy, but melting would not because now we have to take in energy. So guys, let me give you a couple other examples. And these, interestingly, were a lot of them that you came up with. So guys, balls rolling downhill, right? Energy is released, that's spontaneous. We talked about things burning. Well, <laughs> first, Matt said a bomb. Um, but, but we understand that the idea is the same, whether it's a bomb or a Bunsen burner. When things burn, we don't count the initial input of energy that gets it started. If it burns all on its own, that's spontaneous. Interesting, you said nails rusting, which was also on my list. But guys, we now have this general principle, which is true. For a process to be spontaneous, it has to lose energy into the surroundings. Does that make sense? Okay. So guys, let me now show you another example of a spontaneous process, which is now buried behind a large collection of face masks. So guys, some of you have seen these before. <laughs> Quick cold packs. You guys ever used one of these before? So there's actually pellets in here. And guys, these pellets are made of ammonium nitrate. It's just ammonia, can you picture it? NH, so ammonium, NH4, nitrate, NO3. What do you know about the solubility of ammonium? NH4, always soluble, nitrate, always soluble. Guys, this stuff dissolves like crazy, but what do you have to do to make this cold? You got to squeeze it. And if you don't know how these work, when you squeeze this, inside of here is just a bladder of water. So the pellets are ammonium nitrate pellets, and inside here is a bladder of water. And when you squeeze it, the bladder breaks and the ammonium nitrate dissolves into the water. But is this endo or exothermic? This is a cold pack. 
right? So if it's a cold pack, this feels cold relative to us. So we're hot and this is cold. In which direction does energy flow? In or out when this reacts? Energy flows in, right? So guys, that's why this works, is when we break it, it gets cold. Energy flows into the pack and it cools off our skin. So is this giving off energy or taking in energy? It's taking in energy, but guys, here's the trick. Once I squeeze this and pop the bladder, do I have to do anything to it to make it do its thing and get cold? Do I have to convince it to go? So is this spontaneous? It is, but does it take in or give off energy? It takes in energy. Do you see that? So guys, we now have an example of an exception. Quick cold packs are exceptions to this rule. Do you under, it's important that you understand why this is an exception. You guys okay? So guys, here's what we've said in summary. We care about whether or not reactions are spontaneous. We have examples of lots of things that are spontaneous. And what do all these things have in common? They all give out energy. They all are releasing energy into their surroundings. And as they do, they just happen. But now we have an example of a reaction that we know is spontaneous, but it takes in energy rather than gives it off. So guys, this is a definite contradiction to what we've said. So the question is, why? Why is it that this is spontaneous if it's taking in energy rather than giving it off? And guys, part of the answer is this. That the, so if energy has got to be, and you don't need to write down the question, but here's the question. If energy must be lost to the surroundings in order for a reaction to be spontaneous, then how does the quick cold pack work? So guys, here's the scoop. Are you convinced that the quick cold pack is spontaneous? Yeah? Are you convinced that the quick cold pack takes in heat? Yeah? And do you understand that that is a contradiction to our thing that says it has to be giving off energy in order for it to be spontaneous? Do you understand how this all comes together? Because guys, here's the deal. It turns out that this quick cold pack is actually giving off more energy than it's taking in. The problem is this. Our definition of energy is too narrow. See, guys, for us, we can picture hydrocarbons releasing heat. We can, and did you know that nails rusting also are exothermic? That gives off heat. You guys know about this, right? That's how a hot pack works. You know those hot packs you can shove inside your ski gloves to keep you warm? All that's in there is ground up nails. It's just iron filings and a catalyst. And you crack that thing and air gets into it and all that's happening is iron is rusting. But it's in the presence of a catalyst so it happens a whole lot faster. And the heat that heats up your hand is actually this, is just iron rusting. The same thing that happens when nails rust, it's just without the catalyst, it happens so slow that it doesn't warm you up. But guys, when a nail rusts, as slow as it goes, it's still giving off heat. So guys, all of these processes are giving off energy, giving off heat. Here we've got a process that's taking in heat, um, but it's spontaneous. But guys, it turns out that it's actually not a violation to the rule. This is where entropy comes in. Because guys, the, the energy change that is driving this quick cold pack is actually not heat energy, it's disorder energy, and we call that entropy. So let's talk about it. So are you, are you convinced, are you settled with this idea that there is still energy coming out, we just need to expand our understanding of energy? So guys, with that said then, we need to define some terms. And guys, you just have to write these down. As we get into this conversation, uh, there are some things that we need to talk about. So here's where we are. We know that spontaneous processes give off energy. We now know that there are exceptions like quick cold packs that appear to be a violation of the principle when in fact they're not. We just need to talk about a broader understanding of energy exchange. As we do, there are some terms that we need to know. 
One of them is what is called a reversible process. And Nathan, this is going to get to what you were talking about a second ago. So guys, a reversible process is a process in which it is possible to return something to its original state with no net change in the system or the surroundings. which Chandler, you're going to find out, sort of gets to what you were talking about a second ago with the uh, freezing stuff. So guys, again, just terms we need to know. This is an important term. It's called the reversible process. A reversible process is a process in which you can take the products and turn them back into the reactants with no net change to the system or the surroundings. So guys, let me, let me show you a physical example of what we're talking about. You may want to write it down with me. cup of ice water. But now, let's make this a cup of ice water at zero degrees Celsius. Is it freezing or is it melting? Is it freezing or is it melting? The answer is yes. So, guys, here's what's going on. If you have a cup of ice water at exactly zero degrees Celsius, you have ice, right? You have ice and you have water. Now, guys, which one has more energy, the water or the ice? The water because it does not have the crystal lattice, right? In or and you guys remember this from last year, when water freezes and becomes ice, um, the temperature doesn't change, but energy as water freezes, energy is lost because the, the lattice is forming, right? And then we have to add energy to break the lattice down and turn it back into liquid water. And so the idea is that the liquid water has more energy than ice. They're at the same temperature, but the liquid water has more energy because the lattice has been broken. Is that okay? Go ahead. No, the energy is actually lost in the form of order. We're not there yet. But this, so, but here, Donnie, here's, we're going to not talk about order. We're going to talk about disorder. So this is more disordered than this. So liquid water has more entropy than ice. We're going to get there in a couple minutes. But the answer is it's not a work thing. It's a disorder thing. But guys, let's talk about this idea of reversible reactions. So here we've got ice. Here we've got liquid water. Again, are you convinced that the liquid water has more energy? So guys, let's do this then. Because I can't control a whole handful of these dudes, we're just going to go like this. So we've got the liquid water moving around over here. We've got the ice moving around over here. And guys, what eventually happens is one of these water molecules runs into the ice crystal. And when the water molecule runs into the ice crystal, it loses energy. This has more energy. When this runs into this, it loses energy. But guys, where does the energy go? Into the ice crystal. And so literally what happens is this. When this molecule runs into the ice crystal, it hits and freezes. But where does the energy go? Well, it goes into the water molecule that it hit in the ice, and that water molecule gains the energy, and it melts. You get it? Exactly. It's constantly melting and freezing at the same time. So one of these molecules hits and freezes, giving its energy to this guy, which gains the energy, and it melts and leaves. But guys, the idea is this. 
that as this process takes place, there's no net change in either the system or the surroundings because for every liquid molecule that freezes, a solid molecule melts and there's no net change in energy because the energy that is released as it freezes is gains as it melts and it goes in both directions. So it's freezing and melting simultaneously. And what do we call a system that's moving in both directions at the same time? Equilibrium. And guys, that is exactly what's going on here. This is a, I don't want to touch my computer, let this turn on. Guys, this is a system at equilibrium. No, no, no. So, um, so NH3 plus water in equilibrium with NH4 plus and hydroxide. Can you picture that video that we looked at where we put the NH3 into water and the NH3 is still a hydrogen from the water and it separated and made NH4 plus and, oil, and then it came back together and tried. Same thing. This is a reversible process. So NH3 goes into water, makes NH4 and hydroxide, but then they make this, and they're working each other out back and forth. That's also a reversible process. So any system that's at equilibrium is reversible. They're actually the same definition. So if you have a system that's at equilibrium, it is by definition reversible because it's going forward and backward and those changes cancel each other out and there's no net change. Is that okay? Okay. So guys, what about the systems that are not at equilibrium? Well, these are what are called irreversible. So guys, an irreversible process is a process that cannot simply be undone by reversing the events that caused it. So now you're going, okay, give me an example of that. Here, I'm going to give you an example. If I can get it to work. Oh, poop. How do I... Hold on, I'm, I'm having a crisis. Just a second. Does anybody know how to unblock Flash Player? I have it installed. So this is where I'm at. I'm trying to show you something, and all I get is Flash Player is blocked. Oh, here? Oh. Look at you guys. Um, ha! All of this to show you dropping eggs. So, guys, we just talked about this idea of something being irreversible. So, irreversible means that it cannot simply be undone by just uh, by carrying the process out backwards. So let me show you an example. So guys, we've got a couple eggs in the hand, and we click, and up down here. We click, and they fall, and they break, and make a mess. Here's the question. Is this reversible? Can we take the eggs and the yolk and all the other mess and turn them back into the eggs that were originally being held? And guys, the answer is yes. 
But Donnie, to your point a while ago, it's going to take a lot of work. Literally. Guys, in theory, we, we have all the same matter. So in theory, we could take the eggs, take the yolk, take the whites, tuck them back into the eggshell, knit them together at the molecular level, and we could turn the eggs back into what they were before they dropped. But guys, understand the difference is it doesn't go through the same pathway. The pathway for the forward reaction was let go, and after that, everything happened on its own. Sounds familiar? It's spontaneous. Now, guys, can we take the mess and turn it back into eggs? Absolutely, but not through the same pathway. Guys, it would take a lot more work. So guys, maybe you're now making this connection. Don't miss this. Is this reversible? Now, notice what that means. Can it be undone? Oh yeah, we can undo this but it's not reversible because we don't undo it through the same pathway that it happened in the first place. So guys, this is irreversible, but don't be confused. We can force it to go backwards just like we can push a ball uphill, right? Guys, but it doesn't happen on its own. So this has a direction that it does go on its own. This has a direction that it cannot go on its own unless it's pushed or work is done. And so guys, this is irreversible. Just a second. This is irreversible. Are you sold on that? What does irreversible mean? It means it has a, a direction that it can go. It has a direction that it does not go. Is that okay? Because guys, what you're about to find, and Nathan, you said this, because it's irreversible, it's spontaneous. Do you see that connection? Because it's irreversible, it is spontaneous. Dropping the egg is spontaneous. It falls and breaks, and it always goes that direction. Could it go the other direction? Yeah, but it would take a lot of work and it couldn't happen on its own. That egg could never become what it was before on its own. Do you see the idea? So guys, let's bring that together then as a bigger thought and it goes like this. Yeah, so dropping anything, if you drop it, it has a direction it always goes, it has a direction it never goes, so that would be irreversible, therefore spontaneous. So guys, let's pull those ideas together. Irreversible is a process which cannot be undone simply by, um, simply by reversing the events. Our example of that is um, the egg, but guys, it can go backwards. Understand that it can go backwards, but it doesn't go backwards on its own. It has different heat and work values. And then guys, this is where these two ideas come together. And I know that you're seeing this, but let's formally say it. If something is spontaneous, it's a process which proceeds all on its own, and it has a direction that is spontaneous and therefore it's irreversible. Is that okay? How are we doing? Go ahead. No, 
And here's why. This is where we get into... So, guys, Donnie's question... What did I just sit on? Oh, now my shorts are wet. Sorry, couldn't miss that one. Um, so, guys, Donnie's question was, is a process at equilibrium thought of as being spontaneous? So, this is not word games. The idea is this. It, like freezing and melting ice right at zero Celsius. It is spontaneous in both directions. It's moving forward and it's moving backward. So both are happening at the same time without intervention. Is that okay? Yeah. So we don't consider that to be spontaneous. Because the tight definition of spontaneous is it has a direction it always goes and it has a direction it never goes. If it's going both directions at the same time, we call it reversible, but we don't talk about it as being spontaneous. So this is kind of stupid, but think about it this way. How do you know if something is spontaneous? And the answer is because something's happening right? Balls roll downhill, spontaneous. Irons rust, spontaneous. If you've got ice melting and freezing at the same time, there's nothing happening. You don't know anything's taking place because it's moving forward and backward at the same time and it's undoing itself. So it's a weird thought, but the only thing that you've ever experienced in your entire life is a spontaneous process. Because if it's not spontaneous, it doesn't happen. Right? I know. It gets worse. Go ahead. Yes. And actually, it was funny. I was thinking about throwing that up as one of the examples. Was a weak acid and a weak base reacting together? But I chose against it because it's a little complicated. But everything that we know to be weak, weak acids, weak bases, partly soluble salts, we'll get into that later, all of those are reversible processes because they reach equilibrium. Yeah, Braden, you're right on it. Yeah. So, guys, are we settled with this idea? Let me then show you another example of... Let me just say it. I'm going to show you another example of a spontaneous process. So guys, let's think about that. If it is spontaneous, is it reversible? No. It has a direction it always goes. It has a direction it never goes. Now let's relate it to energy. If it is spontaneous, does it take in energy or does it give off energy? Except for the ice pack gives off energy, right? So guys, if something is spontaneous, it is irreversible. It has a direction it always goes. It has a direction it never goes. And we're saying that it gives off energy. But now we're going, wait, we said this takes in energy. And it does take in heat, but it still gives off energy in the form of randomness. And we're going to talk about that now. So guys, don't try to draw this, but let me explain this to you. Don't draw this. Just watch. So guys, imagine that we have this system. These are like two propane tanks. One of the propane tanks is full. The other propane tank is empty. And they're separated by a valve that is shut off. Now, guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to visually open that valve. So there actually shouldn't be any gas over here at all. There's a little mistake in the diagram. But guys, all the gas is on the right. There is no gas on the left. Now, I'm going to open the valve and the temperature does not change. So this is not giving off heat. This is not taking in heat. There is no exchange of heat. But guys, here's the question. When I open the valve, and you can even maybe picture this happening in real life. Guys, if I open the valve, what's going to happen? What is? So explain what you're thinking, Nathan. Okay, and understand this is an atom, it's atmosphere. So we've got one atmosphere of gas over here. So you're saying it'll go to the other side. All of it? No. How much of it? Half of it. And so guys, when we open the valve, they're going to spread out like this evenly. 
and we're going to have half of the gas on one side, and we're going to have the other half of the gas on the other side. Here's the question. Did I have to squeeze this to get that to happen? Did I have to heat this to get this to happen? Did I have to talk to it and coax it to spread out? So was it spontaneous? Yes. Now what about this? Is it irreversible? Will this gas ever go, woohoo, and go back here? No. So it, it doesn't go in that we could squeeze it, right? But that's not through the same pathway. So it is irreversible and therefore spontaneous. So guys, this gas just spontaneously spread out. But it did not lose any heat. So guys, what is the driving force? It's not a loss of heat. What is the driving force that causes that gas to spread out? Keep thinking, open space. So as it spreads out into that open space, why do the gases spread out into these open spaces? And guys, you're not going to like this. But here's the fundamental answer. Because spreading out like that is more random. So here's what this means. Guys, imagine that we have, let's cut this down. Imagine that we have two gas molecules. Let's make it three. Let's make it four. So guys, we've got four gas molecules over here. And when we open the valve, those gas molecules are moving around, right? But what happens if they hit this open space? Well, they end up over here. But then what's that gas molecule doing? It's moving around as well, and eventually it might hit this and go back. But all the while, there are molecules moving in this direction, and eventually these molecules are going to spread out. They're still moving back and forth, but they are now spread out into the container. And guys, the idea is this. Before we open the valve, all four of them are over here. They don't have a whole, just a second, they don't have a whole lot of freedom. All four of those molecules have got to be over here. But after we open the valve, they have now more places that they can be. Because there are more places that they can be, their locations are more random. They are more disordered. And guys, you've got to understand, we live in a universe that is always tending towards systems with greater disorder. And guys, that is the driving force that causes these molecules to spread out. It is literally these molecules moving to positions that give them greater and greater randomness. So now guys, if you don't know what I'm talking about, think about your own bedrooms. If you, if you don't live in your room within a couple of days, days and if you're not careful, careful what does your bedroom look, look like? It's a disaster, it's a disaster right? right? Guys, you guys live, live in, in the middle of this. this. Your bedroom is nearly 10 times towards the disorder. And then your mom comes up and says, clean your room, your room. Your room. And, and that you have like having to do work to clean your room, right? Guys, your bedroom is a fine example of this. This is because you your mom, it's not me, it's just entropy. Just entropy. Because guys, guys, seriously, all the world is towards entropy. entropy. When you when you clean your room, room everything has, has a position on a shelf, shelf right? right? But then but over time, time, I had a sense of that that everywhere, it's all random all over the floor, and that's and more disorder. It has higher randomness, higher disorder, and our universe just tends towards that. Whether it's your bedroom, or whether it's gases in containers, or whether it's quick cold packs. Guys, why does this quick cold pack work? Because when it dissolves, the disorder goes up. Guys, everything in our universe is tending towards conditions of higher disorder. And guys, you gotta understand, this is a very real driving force in the universe. This isn't nebulous, this isn't hypothetical, this is the deal. The driving force in everything that happens in our universe is disorders going up. If you see anything take place, you can be guaranteed that somewhere in our universe, disorders going up. It always happens that way. Yeah? So, 
they're always moving? Are there like mm -hmm. other, like, points of the That's a great question. And the answer to that, we're not going to get into, but if you look in your books and don't do it now, there's, there's an explanation for this using calculus based upon what are called microstates. Um, and they actually go through and they write out all the different microstates. So you could have four and none, one and three, two and two, three and one, all and none. But then if you account for it on the individual molecules, it's not the same two and two at any given time. And if you look at all the different possible combinations or microstates, what you quickly find out is that most of them fall at 50-50 different combinations of specific atoms, but most of them fall at 50-50. So really, all of this is just a probability curve. And the greatest probability is half and half, and that's actually statistically why this works. You guys okay? So guys, here is where we are right now. Randomness is a very, very real thing that drives stuff in our universe and so, guys, it doesn't just drive things like the gas spreading out. It's also the explanation for why the quick cold pack works. So, guys, instead of using the ammonium uh, nitrate, we're going to let silver chloride be our example. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride... I know, we need to hear her. What did we decide her name is? Susie? All right, here comes Susie. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. Okay. Guys, I want you to be entropy hunters, disorder hunters. Here's my question. As salt dissolves in water, is the entropy going up or down? As the salt dissolves in water, is the entropy going up or down? Guys, you can't answer that question. You need to ask me a question in return, which is what? The entropy of what, right? So guys, let's talk. Let's focus individually on this. What about the salt? So salt crystal, high or low disorder? Low, guys, and actually, you ready for this? The definition of absolute zero is actually the temperature at which entropy becomes zero. There's no disorder, right? What does that tell you? So. But guys, crystals are very, very ordered systems. We will always talk in terms of disorder. So the, the disorder of a crystal is very low. Now guys, what about the disorder of water? High or low disorder? Pretty high disorder, right? Ice lower disorder. Remember we said crystals have more have a lower disorder. But guys, liquid water is all messed up. Random positions, mosh pit, very, very high. <laughs> very, very high disorder, right? But now guys, let's look at what happens. As, as the salt dissolves, what's happening to the disorder of the sodiums and the chlorides? It's going up. These things are being ripped apart. Their numbers of positions are going up. The disorder of the crystals going up. But guys, I would propose to you that there is an offsetting decrease in disorder. Where? The water. Guys, check it out. If we move this forward, do you see it? The water is getting organized. The disorder of the water is going down. So we've got an increase in disorder for the salt. We have a decrease in disorder for the water. And guys, understand this completely doesn't have anything to do with heat. This is all about disorder. And so guys, as this process takes place, the water, is its disorder is going down, and the disorder of the salt is going up. 
Does that make sense? Is that is that okay? Go ahead. Well, so when not in the form of heat. So when the disorder of the water goes down, it is it is um, it is no, it's losing energy, but not in the form of heat. In the form of disorder, it turns out that you can actually quantify disorder in the units joules. Yeah, and we're going to do that in just a second. That you can measure. So literally, disorder has an energy associated with it that we measure in joules. So yes, as something becomes less disordered, like the water, it is losing energy, um, but not in the form of heat, necessarily. Yeah. And, and that's where we're going next. Entropy is disorder. So let's talk about it. And guys, this is where we're going to wrap up. We've got about five minutes left. We're going to call it quits here. We're going to take a break and then come back. So guys, entropy is the disorder of a system. Guys, do not think about order. It is disorder. You're saying disorder is high. Yep. So guys, entropy is abbreviated S. We're just going to keep going. And the more, and Nathan, this is exactly what you said, the more disordered or random a system, the higher the entropy. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, so guys, this then, and this is how we're going to wrap up. This then leads us to the second law of thermodynamics. And then we're going to take a break. So guys, let me bring us back to the question. And again, you promised me for sure you're not going to Google this one, right? Sure. Do not look up the second law of thermo. So guys, let's ask the question again. When salt dissolves in water, does disorder go up or down? Both, right? But guys, this is the thing that makes disorder different. And this is called the second law of thermodynamics. So guys, unlike enthalpy, heat, right? Well, write it down and then we'll talk about it. Unlike enthalpy, when we consider entropy changes, we've got to consider the system and the surroundings. And guys, I'm not just going to give you a quick and easy definition for the first second law of thermo. It's coming at the end. But let me give you a taste of it right now. Y'all caught up? What does the first law of thermo say? The law of conservation of energy. Energy lost is energy gained, right? Energy lost by the system. By the way, how do systems gain or lose energy? Heat and work. Guys, any energy lost or gained by the system is gained or lost by the surroundings. Law of conservation of energy, right? First law of thermo. Yeah. Guys, understand the second law of thermo is not the law of conservation of disorder. There is no conservation of disorder. Guys, enter disorder, entropy is not conserved. Entropy always goes up. Entropy always goes up. And guys, in a minute, you're going to find out that is the second law of thermodynamics, that in any spontaneous process, entropy always increases. Guys, anything that you see happen in anywhere, entropy is going up. Any spontaneous process, entropy is going up. So guys, how do we get to that idea? 
Well, the idea is this. When we think about entropy, we do not think about system and surroundings. When we think about entropy, we think about the entropy of the universe. <laughs> And guys, the entropy of the universe is always going up. <clears throat> so you don't need to write this down, but this, well, here, I'll give it to you in equation form. Ready? So the change in entropy of the universe is the system plus the surroundings. We're almost done, guys. So let me try to make this a little, are y'all are y'all caught up? Not quite yet. This would be easier if I printed the notes for you, huh? Maybe. Do you want me to print the notes for the next stuff? Okay. I'll do that while you guys take a break. So guys, let's do this. Go back to our 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 analogy, our idea of an of a cup of ice water at zero. Can you picture it freezing and melting? So guys, if we've got our cup of ice water and that ice water is simultaneously freezing or melting, is entropy going up or down? Yes. What's happening to the entropy of the ice? Going up. What's happening to the entropy of the liquid water? It's going down. Which one is greater? The increase in entropy of the ice or the decrease in entropy of the water? Which one's greater? They're equal. Therefore, guys, there is no change in entropy. But what did we call that freezing melting process? Equilibrium and reversible. So guys, in any reversible equilibrium process, the change in entropy is zero. But guys, this is the one that's crazy. In any irreversible and therefore spontaneous process, the disorder of the universe is actually going up. The entropy or disorder of the universe is going up. But guys, what about this? What about processes that increase? Sorry, let me say it differently. What about processes that decrease disorder? Like when you clean your room. If you are cleaning your room, the disorder is going down. But I thought we just said that if anything happens, there has to be an increase in disorder. So where's the increase in disorder? <laughs> close. Actually close. Where's the increase in disorder? It's what you're doing to your food. Because guys, if you think about it, where do you get the energy to do the work to clean your room? Well, from your food. And how does your body get that energy? Well, the bonds within those food molecules are disrupted. The entropy of your food is increasing. The disorder of your food molecules is increasing. And that, in some way, then gives you the energy. Of course, there's heat transfer, too. But there's the increase in disorder that offsets the decrease in disorder as you're doing work to clean your room. 
It could be, and we're going to talk about those gray areas that hover around zero in a little bit. But guys, you just have to understand fundamentally, in any spontaneous chemical reaction that decreases disorder, there will always be an offsetting increase in disorder somewhere in the universe. Guys, anything that happens causes an increase in disorder. Uh, I know where you're going. Yeah, be careful with that. But guys, this is where we're going to take a break. You okay? So guys, this is your homework. You'll want to look at this by Friday. Well, and so actually, I'd like to talk with you about that. Let me read it to you. So guys, it's 1, 3 A and C, 4, 6, 11, 13, 15, 17, 18, 19, 21 A and B. And you can get this off the website too. 23, 25 A. 27, 29 A and C. So guys, this is what I'm going to offer. Um, I know that technically I'm not going to see you again until the test, but as a school, and this is not just for my class, as a school, we have agreed that regardless of where we are in the alphabet rotation, if students would like to come to campus after school to get help, you can do that. Our thinking is that most students will go home, we'll still be able to maintain our population loads and keep them low and spread out. And so guys, if you would like to come on campus any day after school, regardless of if it's an A through K space, you're welcome to do that. Please just email me ahead of time to let me know you're coming. Um, if you would like, I know that some of you study together. If you'd even like to throw something out on GroupMe and go, hey guys, I'm planning on coming Wednesday to get some help. Anybody want to join in? Guys, let's communicate about that through GroupMe. And I would be more than happy to make myself available anytime after school this week if you want to do study sessions prior to Friday. So you just communicate with me about that. Um, but guys, let's take a break and I'll print your notes for you and we'll come back in a minute.